that we celebrate the most solemn form of worship, which, of course, is the Lord's table. And you'll see that when it comes up. <clears throat> we understand that the study of the truth of the Word of God is the most important form of worship. And, of course, the reason we understand that is because that's what it takes to understand everything else. The study of the Word of God gives us that frame of reference. But then once we have that frame of reference, we need to understand then that the Lord's table is the most solemn form of worship. And that's because it gives us the, the basis, the foundation of our entire life, our entire understanding. And, of course, the importance of this function, which is basically the review of the information concerning the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, is emphasized by the fact that it is the only ritual that is left to us. <clears throat> it's uh, commanded to be observed by the royal family and uh, in the uh, post-canon period of the church age. We understand that the church age is not an age of ritual, but it's the age of reality, and the fact that this ritual is still commanded is a sign of the tremendous importance of this information. According to 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15, the information concerning the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ is the foundation information upon which all spiritual growth is built. We can't have any kind of spiritual growth. We can't have any kind of understanding unless we understand this, this information. And, of course, we recognize this importance by taking a whole class uh, on the last Sunday of the month and devoting it entirely to the communion service. In 1 Corinthians 11, I mean 3, 11 through 15, uh, we haven't read it in a while, so I'll give it to you. It says, For you see, no one is able to lay a foundation other than the one which is being laid, who is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds upon the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, that's, of course, getting information according to the, to the truth of the Word of God. Wood, hay, stubble, slant, straw, and that's getting uh, cosmic information. The, <clears throat> the work of each one shall become manifest. The day, <clears throat> excuse me, manifest. For the day <clears throat> shall make it clear because it will be revealed by, by means of fire. In fact, the fire itself will prove by testing which type of work, which type the work of each one really is. Gosh, I don't know how to read. If the work of anyone which he built upon the foundation remains, he shall receive reward. Then verse 15, and this one is one where people get confused, and Charlie and I were talking about this during the, during the week. Uh, several people think that you can lose your salvation because of this, and it's not talking about salvation here. It's talking about reward, and it says, if the work of anyone is burned up, he shall suffer loss. And this is loss of reward. So that word is at, that phrase has been added in the corrected translation. If the work of anyone is burned up, he shall suffer loss of reward. <clears throat> However, he himself shall be saved in the same manner as one who has passed through fire. Remember that uh, <clears throat> what that means is you're not going to lose your, your uh, uh, salvation, but the reward that is for you, that's in your uh, being held for you at escrow, is not going to be doled out. You will lose that. And so for all eternity, you'll be able to go to your warehouse and say, see all of that? I could have had that, but I didn't because I didn't function properly. Okay? Then we have the fact that a ritual, uh, by definition, is designed to picture, out, picture reality and that the practice of reality without, I mean, the practice the practice of ritual without reality is called by the writer of the book of Hebrews, dead works. And we have Hebrews 6.1. In other words, the importance of the ritual is the reality that it pictures, and there is no power in the ritual itself. Okay, so the, the uh, grape juice stays grape juice. It doesn't uh, transform into the blood of Christ. And the bread stays bread. It doesn't turn into the flesh of Christ. Uh, transconfigur transconfiguration uh, is, 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 not a, uh, is not a biblical principle. Of course, the, uh, the idea is that as just as in the age of Israel, when there was divine discipline for failure to properly perform a ritual, and the reason was that by not performing the ritual, you are distorting the reality that it's teaching, and of course the reality uh, particularly associated with Christology, which is the coming Christ, or soteriology, which is, uh, is associated with salvation, destroying that kind of reality uh, 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 would, would uh, therefore have disastrous effects, uh, <clears throat> then uh, the individual who uh, malfunctioned in that ritual, uh, uh, there was great discipline, including up to death. We saw that with the idea of the Ark of the Covenant when it was being uh, transported and it started to fall off the cart. First of all, it was never supposed to be on a cart. It was supposed to be carried. And when it started to fall off the cart, you had an individual that put his hand up there to keep it from falling off the cart. And if you're a kid, you go, well, gee, what's wrong with that, right? You know, I mean, that makes sense. You've got this wonderful relic. Okay, which was people think it is, which it isn't. Okay, <laughs> and it's going to be destroyed if it falls off this cart. So that guy was just trying to help. But it, well, the idea is that it shows that mankind is trying to help God. 
Okay, the Ark of the Covenant represented uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the idea is that someone could help God, that, that, that destroys the ritual. So the guy, the minute he put his hand on the Ark to try and keep it from falling off the cart, was poof, turned immediately into ash. Okay, uh, because he was going to destroy what that ritual was teaching. Okay, well, we have the same thing here with this reality, with this ritual. Uh, malfunctioning in this ritual can lead to death. And we have that in 1 Corinthians 11, 25 through 31. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, and we get there, saying, this cup is the new covenant, my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks the cup of the Lord is, <clears throat> in an unworthy manner, here's here's the part we're talking about, shall be guilty of the body and of the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in doing so, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. And examining yourself, of course, means being uh, uh, under the divine dinosphere and making sure that you have taken the opportunity to stand in uh, on worship ground. And therefore, before we start the study of the Lord's table this morning, we are going to take our normal free moments of silence. And that's designed to give every believer priest the opportunity and the privacy to, re to use the rebound te technique and make sure that you are st standing on worship ground. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together once again as a congregation and study the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and perform properly in this ritual. We ask that God the Holy Spirit would give us everything necessary to function properly, and that includes, of course, the, <clears throat> the uh, divine discipline, uh, humility, uh, uh, genuine humility, excuse me, and anything else that we might properly need in order to study. And we ask that God the Holy Spirit would give this to us, and we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Okay. The Lord's table. We understand that the Lord's table is divided into two <clears throat> pieces. We have the perfect work, person, and the perfect work. The first category, the perfect person of the Lord Jesus Christ, is the indication and the information associated with the fact that he is the unique person of the universe and the only one qualified to pay for the sins of the world. This, of course, is represented in the ritual by a single cup. Single cup. Let me stop for a second here. Okay. By a single loaf or portion of unleavened bread broken or divided into individual portions to be consumed by many individuals celebrating the Lord's table. And we have 1 Corinthians 10, 17, which is up there. And then the second category is the perfect and unique work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. And that's the only thing that can buy or procure salvation. And this is represented in the ritual by a single cup or container of unfermented wine, which of course is grape juice divided into individual portions or glasses to be consumed by the many individuals celebrating the Lord's table. And for that, we have 1 Corinthians 10, 16a. <clears throat> the idea, then, that we are also to understand is that salvation, okay, that salvation, no matter when it's addressed, from the fall of mankind to the last person to be saved in human history, is always related to accepting both the person represented by the bread and the work represented by the cup of the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. This is made clear by the Lord himself in John 6, 49 through 58. And the one we always do is 53 and 54. And that's up there. It says, therefore, Jesus said to them, and he's speaking to Jews, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and that's figurative language, meaning that unless you use your own volition to accept the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and drink his blood, and of course, that's figurative to mean to, to uh, accept his work. You do not have life in yourselves. The one eating my flesh and drinking my blood has eternal life, and I myself will raise him up in the last day. Of course, <clears throat> the last day for the Old Testament believer refers to the second advent, and for the New Testament believer, this refers to the rapture of the church. We understand that the reason that unleavened bread and grape juice is required is that in this ritual, and <clears throat> leaven is a picture of sin, and its pervasiveness or the ability to spread and pollute. Okay? If raised bread were used, and raised bread is made raised by, uh, by leaven, by yeast, okay, we'd be saying in the ritual picture that the person of the Lord Jesus Christ was in some way sinful. If alcohol, which is fermented wine, okay, and that's made by yeast, uh, were used, we'd be saying that in the ritual picture that the work of the Lord Jesus Christ was in some way sinful. Therefore, uh, we do not use raised bread, we do not use wine, we use unleavened bread and grape juice, because doing otherwise would be both unthinkable, unthinkable and blasphemous. 
Then, now that we've covered the general information, what we're going to go to now is the specific information that's associated with the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, first, we always start with the person, because without the person, we understand no qualification. If we had no qualification, no matter what he did, it wouldn't have, uh, wouldn't have uh, benefited us, so there would have been no work. And of course, if there was no work, then we would still all be in the slave market of sin, and there would be no salvation. So the category we always take first is the person. When you take your uh, individual portion of unleavened bread and eat it, this, of course, is a picture of your personal non-meritorious faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. According to 1 Corinthians 10, 17, it's also a picture of having accepted Christ as Savior. You're also a member of the one body of Christ or the church universal. Remember, when we have church, we have the idea of we have a local church and we have a church universal. We are members of both. Okay, in, in this ritual, of course, eating is a picture of believing. And the idea is that by eating this, you are showing the picture of believing. And it's non-meritorious because we understand that everybody eats, okay? Skinny people eat, fat people eat, uh, you know, moral people eat, immoral people eat. The idea is there is no merit in eating and there is no merit in uh, believing. Uh, that's the result of believing. That is the, that, uh, is the main point. We also understand that the uh, first thing that a new believer should be taught after he's accepted Christ is that he's been baptized in the body of Christ. Now he has responsibility to function properly as part of that body. We have 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. This, of course, is made clear in the pre-canon period of the church age, which means that the time before the Bible was written and easily, re and easily read, we had a, a, a populace that uh, many of whom did not have the capability to read. Okay, so things had to be demonstrated. And we had others that could read, but before, remember, this is before the printing press, and so you didn't have uh, a lot of information to read, okay, unless it was carved in stone on a pillar somewhere, you know, or passed as papyri that you were fortunate enough, meaning rich, uh, to have. Books were very much of a luxury, okay? So things were, were taught by word of mouth, obviously. And one of the things that we had here then was what we call a experiential representative analogy, meaning it was something that was shown uh, to an individual. It was, it was felt, he experienced it, it was representative of what happens to him, and an analogy means that just that, it's an analogy, it's, it's teaching by, by example, okay, and it was designed to teach positional truth, that was baptism, okay, for by one spirit we were baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greek, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit, that's 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Then we have Acts 8, 35 through 39, and that's the story of Philip and the eunuch. And the idea is that uh, before, the, before the canon was completed, the way you could teach individuals uh, positional truth was by doing this uh, baptism. We no longer baptize our children. Uh, we don't have to. You, you can. There's nothing uh, wrong with it, uh, except that, you know, except that it, it isn't necessary. Okay, so if you're trying to say that if you haven't been baptized, uh, you're not a believer, which many churches believe, uh, that's wrong. You don't have to undergo water baptism to be a believer. It's just a teaching tool. Okay, you would never uh, have to force a teaching tool on individuals that don't need it. But if there may be someone who wants to learn it, that's fine. Then you have to do it properly. But the idea is that we don't do it anymore because we have the completed canon of Scripture. We have all the information necessary for us to understand what happened to us at the moment of salvation. Uh, so as we go forward now, we're going to study the information associated with the person of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, we try and do it as logically as possible. And that means that we start off with the doctrine of the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity uh, starts off with the essence box. And the essence box is the, the, uh, the uh, characteristics of God, the attributes of God. We have sovereignty, love, eternal life, omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence, immutability, veracity, righteousness and justice. That's what God is. That's what you should think of when you think of God. You shouldn't think of a Santa Claus without a hat, as Jack used to say, okay? Uh, or as in Monty Python and the Holy Grail, they had this little floating head up in the clouds, right? You know, that's not God, okay? <clears throat> God is this. God is perfect essence, okay? There is one perfect essence, and that one perfect essence is, is uh, contained by three personalities. We have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit from the standpoint of systematic theology. And systematic theology, of course, is, is uh, the study of God with reference to creatures and creation, which, of course, is very important to us since we fall into that category. But if you have theology proper, which is just the study of God without respect to that, we have the first person, second person, and third person of the Trinity. And, of course, we've studied the uh, Trinity now. I used to uh, say in here that someday we would. Well, we that someday came and went, and we studied the Trinity. And in the Trinity, we studied why, we, why that's represented as a triangle. And the idea gives us that a triangle is a single unit. 
okay? Uh, a triangle is a single shape, but you can't have the triangle without having three corners, and you can't have the Godhead without having the three personalities. But the three personalities are not individual gods, okay? <clears throat> Uh, we've gone through and, and studied uh, each of the each of these uh, uh, elements in the essence, and I've given you plenty of justification for each of them. Uh, someday, again, in one of my my little some days, okay, someday we'll go ahead and take a a whole Sunday to do communion, and we'll go back through that again so that you have an opportunity to review that. Uh, otherwise, you can, if you want, we can uh, print you out a copy of of what I have here, and and uh, you can review that on your own. But the doctrine of the Trinity, the idea is that God is one in essence, and there are three personalities. And there's only one infinite and perfect essence, therefore there's only one God. But that one uh, uh, essence is manifested in the three personalities. And then the real issue here, as far as our review is concerned, is the fact that God is one in essence, he's three in personality, and the Lord Jesus Christ, who we understand is the second member of the Trinity, is in fact undiminished deity. He is an undiminished deity before the first advent, and he's undiminished deity after the first advent. He is undiminished deity right now. Okay, That's one of the things individuals have to understand. When God, uh, the Son, okay, came in the first advent, uh, as we're going to see, he did not uh, change, and now, and now he's not God any longer. Okay, He's man. That's not what you should take away. We study that when we study the hypostatic union. He is God, and he is always going to be God, and he is undiminished deity. We also understand that all three members of the Trinity are co-equal and co-eternal. So God the Son has all of the same attribute and, and the capabilities as God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. The next, we have the idea of the doctrine of the virgin birth. This is a technical term, which of course includes really the, the main concept, which is the virgin pregnancy. It's not so much the birth, the birth, it's the way and the manner in which the virgin became pregnant. And the idea is that the virgin pregnancy is important from three standpoints. First, we have the area of sin. In order for the Lord Jesus Christ to be qualified to take our place and pay for the sins of the world, and thus provide the potential for salvation for mankind, he first had to be born exactly as Adam was created, which means he had to be born trichotomous with a body, a soul, and a human spirit. He had to exist as Adam existed in a perfect environment, which of course is, is uh, given to him as the perfect uh, prototype divine dinosphere. He also had to be born without an old sin nature. That's number two. There he had to be born, or the second dash, he was born without the old sin nature, without the imputation of Adam's original sin. We understand that he, uh, had he had the, uh, Adam's original sin, he would have been in the dynasty of Adam. Instead, he had to be in his own dynasty, the dynasty of Christ. And then <clears throat> the third sub-point is that in order for this to become a historical reality, the chain of the old sin nature being passed down from the father to the child had to be broken. And the idea is that this was, was oh, excuse me, that's still in a second. This was uh, broken by God the Holy Spirit, providing the 23 perfect uncontaminated chromosomes to fertilize the female ovum of the Virgin Mary with its cleansed 23 chromosomes. And we've gone through and studied uh, how uh, the sex cells are generated and how that, that uh, ovum is cleansed and then how the, the uh, ovum is then fertilized. Uh, <clears throat> as a result of receiving the perfect human, not godly, but perfect human sperm cell, okay, the body of the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ was formed in the womb of the Virgin Mary, and it was formed without the contamination of the old sin nature. And then, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ had to spend his entire life during the first advent in the sphere of his internal perfect environment without committing a single act of personal sin. And that means no mental attitude sins, no sins of the tongue, and no overt sins. And we have a bunch of passages there that confirm that's exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ did. Uh, we have 2 Corinthians 5.21, Hebrews 4.15, 1 Peter 2.22, and 1 John 3.5. Second, and still related to the virgin birth, is the area of prophecy. We understand that Isaiah 7.14 says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give to you a sign. Behold, the virgin will become pregnant and will certainly go through the process of bearing a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. So the idea is that if the Virgin Mary did not become pregnant, if this did not happen, then God would be a liar, and if God were a liar, then of course uh, he would lose the old sin, I mean, he would lose the uh, the uh, uh, angelic conflict, and we would not uh, therefore have salvation. And finally, the third point is the curse of Kaniah. So we have sin, we have prophecy, and then we have the curse of Kaniah. We also saw that Kaniah is called Jehoiachin, Jeconias, Jeconiah, and Je Jehoiakim. And he was the 19th king of the southern kingdom of Judah at the start of the, after the start of the divided kingdom. He was 18 years old when he began his reign, 
and he was right before King Zedekiah. King Zedekiah was the last king. Okay, so Kaniah was the second to the last king. And King Zedekiah was the king that in 597, uh, uh, when, when Judah, uh, the southern kingdom, went out under the fifth cycle of discipline. We understand that Kaniah was such a poor excuse for a king that he, the Lord only allowed him to rule for three months and ten days. And then he was taken down into, or taken up, captivity in Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar. And he stayed there until his death. In Jeremiah 22.30, the Lord told us that as a result of the lousy rule, excuse me, of Kaniah, he would be childless, which means that none of his descendants would ever sit on the throne of David. And this, of course, is important to us because Joseph, the legal father of the Lord Jesus Christ, is in the line of Kaniah. And we spent some time at one point going through the lineage, and we see that there's a direct that Joseph is a direct descendant of Kaniah. So therefore, if Joseph was the biological father rather than just the legal father, then the Lord Jesus Christ would also be in the line of Kaniah, and he would not be able to uh, be in the, uh, sit on the throne of David. Uh, if he did, then God would be a liar, and if God was a liar, then he would lose the angelic conflict, okay? And if he didn't, then God would also be a liar, because we understand from prophecy that the Lord Jesus Christ is, as the lion of the tribe of Judah, has got to sit on the throne of David for eternity. He's got to do a lot of other things associated <clears throat> with being part of the Davidic dynasty. <clears throat> of course, the real issue, after all of this is said and done, the real issue is the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ is a result of the seed of the woman, uh, being fertilized by God the Holy Spirit. And we understand that uh, the seed of the woman indeed gives us the idea that he is true humanity and fulfills the prophecy that is given in Genesis 3, 15. Next, we have the doctrine of the hypostatic union. We can get to the hypostatic union because logically we've covered the first two parts, uh, which is God. We have the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ is God, undiminished deity, and he is man, true humanity. But he doesn't exist as just undiminished deity, nor as true humanity. He exists in the hypostatic union. The hypostatic union, the statement is that the Lord Jesus Christ is undiminished deity and true humanity in one person forever. The attributes of deity in no way add to, subtract from, or change the attributes of humanity, and vice versa. That's the theological uh, definition of the hypostatic union. The hypostatic union, of course, is what makes the Lord Jesus Christ the perfect and only mediator between God and man. He is the only individual who can place equally a hand on God and a hand on man and be that mediator. We have 1 Corinthians 12, 5 compared with 1 Timothy 2, 5. For you see, there is one God and there is one mediator between God and mankind, the man, Christ Jesus. Therefore, he is the unique person of the universe, the only one qualified to perform this work of salvation. We understand that this uniqueness is clearly revealed in Scripture when we recognize it. For example, in Deuteronomy 6, 4. Oops. In Deuteronomy 6, 4, we have, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is unique. That's called the Shema passage because it starts off with Shema Israel, which means listen up, perk your ears up. The idea is that the Lord is our God and he is unique. It's not that the Lord is one. The Lord is unique. He is the only one that is like this. In John 3, 16, we have, For you see in this way, the God loved the world, and that he gave his uniquely born Son, in order that whoever believes in him might not perish, but might be having eternal life. The idea is that he wasn't uh, the only begotten. That means that he was uniquely born. He is uniquely born because of the <clears throat> way in which he came into existence in the humanity. We have the fact that the scripture recognizes and emphasizes the deity, humanity, and hypostatic union, uh, the three parts of the hypostatic union, by using three grammatical terms. The deity, as I've already clicked up here, is given to us and represented by kurios, which we translate as Lord. The humanity is by Jesus, which we transliterate as Jesus, okay? And the hypostatic union then is emphasized by Christos or Christ, okay, transliteration. <clears throat> the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, also represents himself in the Bible as speaking of, from his deity in John 8, 58, when he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham came into existence, I myself keep on being. Or as it's translated in the English, before Abraham, I am, right? That's the great I am. Uh, the idea is that he was uh, in, uh, in uh, <clears throat> deity long, long before, <laughs> as in eternity past. Okay, he speaks from his humanity when on the cross he says, I'm thirsty. In John 19, 28, uh, deity is not subjected to thirst. Deity is sovereign, is not, cannot be subjected to thirst. So he's speaking from his humanity. And then, of course, he speaks from his hypostatic union when he talks about salvation. And in John 14, 6, he says, I myself keep on being the way, the truth, and the life. Not one person can come face to face with the Father except through the instrumentality of me. <clears throat> so, we understand the humanity. I mean, we understand the hypostatic union. Related to the hypostatic union, then, uh, next, logically, we have the doctrine of impeccability. So, we keep the same diagram on here. 
The idea is that peccable means to be liable to sin and error, and therefore the term impeccable means not liable to sin and error. We understand that all mankind is liable to sin and error, but the Lord Jesus Christ in hypostatic union is not liable to sin and error. This, of course, is extremely important to us because it's the basis for our uh, understanding of eternal security. In the garden, Adam and the woman didn't possess eternal life. They had what was called conditional physical immortality. In other words, the immortality was based on the condition that they functioned properly, that they did not uh, uh, commit an act of personal sin. We understand that from Genesis 2, 17, it says, dying you shall die. That means if they committed an act of personal sin, they would die spiritually, and then they would die physically. We, on the other hand, are told that we have eternal life, which in the Greek is zoe ionios, and that's based upon our acceptance of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's John 6, 53 and 54. Our eternal life doesn't depend on our continued proper function, therefore it's not, you know, it's not a conditional, uh, 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 conditional immortality, but it's based on the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's provided and freely given to us, and that includes his eternal perfection, his eternal perfection. The Hebrew says in Hebrew, I mean, the Bible says in Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That means that if he could have sinned in the first advent, that's the yesterday part, then he could sin now, that's the today part, or he could sin in the future, that's the forever. If he could sin in the future, then we wouldn't have eternal life. What we would have instead was back to a conditional immortality, and that condition now would not be based on our function, it would be based on the function of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we understand that we do have eternal security, and that eternal security is given to us in very, you know, in lots and lots of passages, many of which I have on the board here. So the idea is it's been promised to us, and the only way it can be promised to us is that it's going to be eternal, and therefore, logically, we have to understand that the Lord Jesus Christ then cannot sin, okay? Because if he did sin, we would lose that, <clears throat> that, uh, salvation the idea here is that <clears throat> god is neither temptable nor peccable and we've gone through when i went through the uh, es the elements and the essence of god i showed how they were not uh, they could not uh, lead to temptation or, or uh, peccability mankind however is temptable and peccable but god is, but the lord jesus christ is neither just deity nor just humanity he is in the hypostatic union and there we have the fact that he is temptable but he is not peccable. He cannot sin and will not sin. Uh, the idea that he is temptable is given to us in Matthew, uh, as well as the fact that, that uh, he does not sin. That's given to us in Matthew 4, 4 and following. Next is the doctrine of kenosis. I've given you a definition of kenosis in the past. And I've even given, uh, put up there now uh, the, the passage that we get it from, and that's Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Having this attribute in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be claimed, but emptied himself, and emptied there is echinacin, which means, which is from kenosis. It means to empty, to render, uh, void. Okay, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave and being made in the likeness of man. Being found in appearance as man, he humbled himself by become, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. The idea being that he <clears throat> set aside certain of his divine uh, attributes in order to function properly with respect to the, the, uh, the divine dinosaur that was provided in the power of God the Holy Spirit. This is done in conformity to the will of God and the plan of God for uh, his existence in the first advent. Of course, it's important to understand that God the Son didn't lose any of the attributes since he is God and he's immutable. However, he chose to fulfill the plan of God for salvation and therefore voluntarily subordinated himself to God the Father. This is presented to us in John 5, 19, where it is said the Son can do nothing of himself, the idea being that he's using the power of God the Holy Spirit and functioning under the will of God the Father. And I've given you the idea of this being represented by the burning bush uh, and, uh, and the hypostatic being, union being represented by the burning bush. And the fact that he is a God man. What we have uh, when he voluntarily subjugated himself is the fact that God the Father presented the first Christmas present to the Lord Jesus Christ at his birth. That first Christmas present was the providing the, the provision of the divine dinosphere, with emphasis on gate one, which is filling of the Holy Spirit. And this is also the provision of the internal perfect environment necessary to fulfill the equivalency requirement between the first and last Adam. Remember, we said he not only had to be born without an old sin nature, but he had to live in a perfect environment. God the Father did not choose to make the earth a perfect environment anymore. Instead, what he did is he provided a perfect spiritual environment, and that is the divine dinosaur for the Lord Jesus Christ to reside, in which the Lord Jesus Christ could reside. 
almost the end of that sentence with a preposition. I'd have been shot. Anyway, <laughs> what the doctrine tells us is that during the first advent, instead of relying on his own divine attributes, uh, primarily his own omnipotence, uh, you know, his all powerfulness, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ relied on the power of, provided by God the Holy Spirit in the filling of the Holy Spirit under the, the uh, provision of the divine dinosphere. Then, of course, he used or test drove the prototype divine dinosphere for 33 years and manifested the angelic conflict. And more importantly, we should understand this, okay, that the divine dinosphere is perfectly of capable, perfectly capable of providing all of the divine operating power necessary to fulfill any of the most difficult responsibilities and obligations that the plan of God can throw at any individual in the human race. Okay, if the Lord Jesus Christ can use the power of God, the Holy Spirit, to never commit a sin. We should be able to use the power of the Holy Spirit under the divine dinosphere to uh, minimize our sin. We're not going to be perfect, okay? Uh, it's too late for everybody here because you've all sinned at least once, okay? But the idea is you can minimize that sin, okay, by using this perfect, uh, 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 perfect uh, provision. And then we see that this was prophesied in Isaiah 11, 1 through 3, and Isaiah 42, 1. Then it's demonstrated by the fact that at his baptism, uh, the God, we, excuse me, John the, John the baptizer, saw God the Holy Spirit descend on Christ in the form of a dove. That's given to us in Matthew 3.16 and John 1, 32-33. Once we realize this, we also realize that 10 days after Christ's resurrection, his ascension in the beginning of, <clears throat> excuse me, in the beginning of, uh, excuse me, on the day of Pentecost and, and the beginning of the church age, we have the idea that uh, he provided this operational divine dinosphere to us. And this, of course, is an internal perfect environment for us that's always available. It's that bathosphere, that idea that as things are getting horrible, you can always uh, make sure that you are understand you are handling all of the pressures by allowing God to handle them for you, by functioning properly in the divine dinosphere, by having all of those pressures uh, bounce right off of uh, our perfect environment that we have. As long as we stay in, we are protected. When we decide to get out, then uh, we are no longer protected and we're on our own. Okay? And we have our whole scripture package, Ephesians 5.18, Galatians 5.16, 1 Corinthians 14.1a, 1 Corinthians 16.14, 2 John 6, Ephesians 4.30, and 1 Thessalonians 5.19. You take those and then you compare them all with Galatians 5.22 and 23, you get the idea of the results, and that's the fruit of the Spirit. And then finally, in reviewing... The work, I mean, the, the qualification associated with the Lord Jesus Christ, we have that equivalency factor. We have that idea of the last Adam. And here the idea is that when Adam was created, uh, we had the Garden of Eden, and the idea was in the Garden of Eden there was only one way that Adam could sin, and that was, of course, eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, that's the only way he could have chosen. He was given free will, uh, uh, which is the key to the angelic conflict. He was given free will, and he could do, uh, uh, make a decision to eat from that tree. He decided not to for quite some time. And he would go in and he would uh, have to eat from the, the tree of life, which is right next to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He'd eat from the tree of life uh, so that he could be sustained. And then he would look at the tree of the, of the knowledge of good and evil and say, oops, I'm not supposed to eat from that. And then he would go off and he would get doctrine, okay, and name another uh, an animal or two, right? And pretty soon, after going through all the animals, not finding a help meat that perfectly matched him, he went to God and said, I don't find anybody. And God said, good, okay, you, you chose not to go with any of the animals. Therefore, I will create for you a perfect helper. Uh, someone who matches you body and soul. And he created uh, Asha, uh, Isha. He created Eve, okay? And so we have Eve coming into existence. And <clears throat> they uh, were managed to function properly for quite some time. We don't know how long, okay? It could have been billions of years. We don't know. But anyway, they, they uh, functioned properly. And then at one point, Eve uh, started uh, uh, not coming, not getting doctrine, if you will, uh, at the spiritual time of the day, not the uh, not the windy or breezy or quiet or whatever time of the day, it's as, as the King James says. Instead, it was a spiritual time of the day when they got doctrine. She quit coming, and she was uh, distracted. She was led astray. She wandered. She was deluded, <laughs> okay? We're tying this into our class to just a, a half an hour ago, okay? She was... She was uh, deluded. She didn't uh, uh, stick with the truth. She started falling away from that information, okay? And finally, at some point, the, her pet the, uh, was indwelt by Satan and convinced her that all she had to do was eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and she would be like the Most High God, exactly like what Satan was saying in his I wills, okay? And so she went, and she ate, and she fell. And then she went to Adam, and she said, here, you eat, okay? And Adam looked at God, looked at the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ looked at Eve and said, 
I think I'd rather be with Eve. And so he ate and he fell. Okay. And so we have the pressure from Eve's fall leading to the fall of Adam. And at that point, when he fell as the seminal head uh, for federal or seminal head for all mankind, all mankind fell. Okay. The idea then, however, was that the Lord Jesus Christ, in order to be qualified to pay for the sins of the world, had to undergo more pressure and not fall. Okay, that's the idea of, of uh, if someone does 100 push-ups and you want to prove you're stronger than they are, you can't just do 100 and stop. you got to do 101. <laughs> okay, so the idea is that he had to undergo more pressure than Adam underwent and not fall. And of course, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ started undergoing pressure, pressure from the moment he was born. You have Herod going nuts. You have the slaughter of what they call the slaughter of the innocents. It's the slaughter of the children. Okay, given that it takes time for, for news. They didn't have the internet, right? So it took the time for news to, to transfer. So what happened is Herod... Uh, uh, sent out a message that all of the kids uh, from two down be uh, executed, okay? And so you have uh, the, the slaughter of the firstborn, and, and uh, uh, Joseph and Mary uh, escaped down to Egypt, okay, and kept, uh, kept uh, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ safe and then brought him back, okay? But he was under pressure uh, from the time he was born all the way up to the first three hours on the cross. He was, uh, here's the God-man of the universe being spit on, being beaten, being nailed to a cross, being humiliated, uh, you know, having the rotten fruit and all that stuff thrown at him, had the throne, the, in mockery, having the, thor the crown of thorns uh, pressed into his head, okay? All of that, having the, the mockery of the scribe uh, that was nailed to the cross, uh, you know, and then, of course, being put up on the cross in the company of of uh, two other criminals, okay, as if he were a criminal. And at no point did he commit an act of personal sin, neither uh, 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 sins of the tongue, nor an overt sin, and then here's the real kicker, nor a mental attitude sin, okay? And so at that point, he had undergone all that pressure, and at that point, the scales flipped in terms of pressure, and, and uh, he now had undergone more pressure, and therefore he was qualified to pay for the sins of the world. Like, I have to be careful because it used to be, I think, when John, you know, it used to be that you know, this would mean that he fell. It didn't fell. He didn't fall. That means he had more pressure, okay? So that means that he's now, we now understand the qualifications of the Lord Jesus Christ. So therefore, we're going to pass out the bread. I'm going to say a short prayer. We'll read the pertinent scripture, take a few moments to reflect on the information we just reviewed, and then we'll have the second category. I'll say a short prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to once again review and study the information associated with the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in, partic in particular, at this point, the information associated with the qualifications that we've just reviewed. We understand that this ritual, uh, <clears throat> receiving the bread, represents the, the, uh, the person, and receiving the grape juice represents uh, the uh, work. But we also understand that as food and drink, uh, that we ask that you set this aside for not only the proper function of the ritual, but also for the proper function of our bodies. And we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, the scripture that we do is 1 Corinthians 10, I mean, 11, 23 and 24. 23 says, For I myself <clears throat> received from the Lord that which I, in fact, delivered to you, so thank you all, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was being betrayed, took bread. And after having given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, the one existing on your behalf. Keep on doing this in remembrance of me. Let us partake.
All right, let's get started in the second one. <clears throat> must be uh, trying to cover it as quickly as I can and not stumble over my tongue, but I must be taking a little bit longer. It's already quarter after. So we're going to get moving here. So the next or the second base category is the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the idea is when you take your individual cup of unfermented wine or grape juice and drink it, it's a picture of your, non, of your personal non meritorious faith and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. It's also a test of the doctrine that you have in the right lobe of your soul related to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. Uh, when with salvation, we understand that we have a new authorizing agent instead of the Mosaic Law, which authorized the Passover and also taught the individuals that salvation could not come from obeying the law. We now have, the represent, we now have it replaced by the law of freedom and liberty, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. We have the royal law, the new covenant's land contract to the royal family, I mean to the church or the royal family honor code. <clears throat> we have passages associated with that. When we look at the cross, we see that the cross can be looked at from three different ways. We have it from the standpoint of God, which is propitiation. In other words, <clears throat> the essence of God, the Father is perfectly satisfied by the work of Christ on the cross. Then we have the, the second one is the uh, sinward side, which is redemption. In other words, Christ paid the ransom price or the purchase price for salvation and redeemed us from the slave market of sin. And the third is uh, reconciliation. In other words, mankind is reconciled to God and the, as a result of the person and the work of Christ on the cross. And of course, we always go with the doctrine of reconciliation because it, consider, it, can, it includes all of the other principles necessary for us to totally understand what has happened to us. But in order to understand this, first we have to understand the barrier, the barrier that was erected when Adam fell. Remember when Adam fell, there was a barrier between God and all mankind because Adam was the, the head, was the seminal head of all mankind. So this barrier was erected, and we represent it by six bricks. The first brick we have is sin, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In other words, <clears throat> as a result of that sin, we cannot have a, an association with God. And we've gone through uh, many of the, much of the information associated with sin and why sin and how God can allow sin to happen in the human race. At some point in time, we'll review that as well. Then the second brick we have that was created as a result of the fall was the penalty for sin. And that's given to us by Romans 6.23. For the wages from the sin is death. And this, of course, is spiritual death. Uh, and, and, well, spiritual death is not the punishment, I should say, of course. Spiritual death is not the punishment for sin itself. It's the environment. Okay, in which anyone must be qualified to pay for sins. That's called the metonymy of the subject. Okay, and then we have the fact that spiritual death causes a spiritual separation of mankind from God. And that's given to us in Isaiah 59 2. Your iniquity, slant guilt, that's sin, have made a separation between you and your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear you. And we see much information associated with the penalty for sin. And then we have physical birth. That's given to us in John 3 3 and 5. John 3 says, Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless anyone is born again. Not the idea of actually having physical birth again, but it, it, we, we understand born again when we see <clears throat> what the work takes away. Okay, Unless any of you is born again, he is not able to see the kingdom of God. The idea is because of our physical birth and imputation of Adam's original sin, that's what keeps us from having a relationship with God. The Adam's original sin uh, keeps us from being able to have that relationship. So we need to be regenerated. Then we have the character of God, 1 John 1, 5. God's character and man's character cannot coexist, okay, because God is light and we are darkness. It says, in the message which we have heard from him and pass on to you, you all is this, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. As a result of Adam's original sin, as a result of our character now, we are darkness, and darkness cannot have a rep any kind of association with light. It's a very easy thing for us to see on a day-by-day -day basis. You go into a room, dark room, what do you do? You turn on the light. Half of the room doesn't get light and half the room stay dark, usually, unless you have a very, very bad uh, light bulb. But the idea is that uh, there's light to some extent everywhere in that room, and that's because light and dark cannot coexist in the same place. Okay? <clears throat> then we have relative righteousness or man's righteousness, what we call minus R. Isaiah 64, 6, A and B says, For all of us have become like the unclean one. That's Adam in his fallen state. And all our righteousnesses are like a cloth of menstruation meaning that the best that we can do uh, when we do our absolute best in righteousness is no better than that stained cloth with a woman's discharge from her menstrual cycle. <clears throat> we also have in Romans 3.10, just as it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. And when it says, when the Bible says none like that, that means absolutely none. There's not one person say, well, what about me? No, you're included in that, okay? 
So because we can only have relative righteousness and not absolute or perfect righteousness, God's essence demands condemnation. And then finally, we have position in Adam, 1 Corinthians 15, 22a. For, all, for as in fact in Adam all die. Okay, that tells us that all who are born physically and in the dynasty of Adam are spiritually dead and looking forward to the second death. And we've studied information associated with the second death. But the idea is because of the fall, there was a genetic change in Adam and Eve with the introduction of the old sin nature, spiritual death, followed by aging and physical death. And that's exactly what we all have to look forward to. Now, each brick of the barrier has been removed by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, and it is explained or documented by a doctrine that we've studied in the past or a categorical concept. So sin is taken away and explained by two doctrines, redemption and unlimited atonement. First, redemption, uh, the passage we normally go through is first, I mean, it's Colossians 1, 13 and 14, who delivered us out from the dominion of the darkness, that's Satan's cosmic system, and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we keep on possessing the redemption, the forgiveness of our sin. And we've gone through it to understand what redemption means. And we've gone through the slave market of sin and how you redeem someone from the slave market of sin and the four qualifications that a redeemer needed to have and how the Lord Jesus Christ has met all four of those qualifications. So we understand redemption and the fact that we have been redeemed and purchased out of the late slave market of sin. Then we have unlimited atonement. And the unlimited atonement tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ's work was efficacious for everybody who will accept it. Okay, And it's offered freely to everybody. It's not just given to a specific set as the Calvinists believe. Uh, and the idea is that Christ's work on the cross was efficacious for everyone. We have 1 John 2, 2. In fact, he himself keeps on being the expiation for our sins. Moreover, not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the entire world. We have 1 Timothy 2, 3 and 4, which we've gone over many times. We have John 1, 29. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Not the sins of those who, for, who were forgiven. The sins of the world is freely offered to the world. Okay, and the Lord says it himself in John 12, 47. I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Okay, so back in eternity past, uh, God did not say you, 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 not you, not you, you, not you. Instead, it's based entirely on our own volition. It's freely offered to everyone. Okay. Then we have <clears throat> penalty for sin taken away, from Christ, or taken away by Christ's work on the cross, and it's explained by expiation. Expiation, we understand, it says the active means of expiating or of making reparation or satisfaction as for offense or sin, the removing of guilt by suffering of punishment. Okay, Guilt is said to be expiated when it is visited with punishment falling on a substitute. So expiation means the, the substitutionary work of the Lord Jesus Christ in suffering the punishment that was supposed to be ours. Okay, we have Colossians 2.14. By having canceled the certificate of indebtedness, which stood against us, it was us, with its legal demands, which kept on being hostile to us. In fact, he as a substitute, he as the exp expiation, okay? He has taken it out of the way by having nailed it to the cross. The idea being representative that, that by nailing it to the cross, we mean uh, undergoing and paying for the sins of the world, okay? Therefore, his substitutionary work is what we mean when we talk about expiation. Physical birth was taken care of by Christ's work on the cross, and it's given to us by regeneration. The idea here is given to us in 1 Peter 1, 3. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his great mercy, caused us to be born again unto a living hope through the instrumentality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ out from the dead. The idea being that regeneration is, in Greek, it's polygnesia. And polygnesia means to rebirth or regeneration. And we have it used twice in the New Testament, Matthew 19, 28, and, Tim, and Titus 3, 5. And I usually read Titus 3, 5. He saved us, and then we have underlined, not on the basis of deeds made, slant, done, and relative righteousness, but, and it goes on, by means of his mercy, by washing, slant, pur purification of regeneration, and renewing by the Holy Spirit. So the idea is re regeneration is the giving of spiritual life. It's, it's being regenerated to become trichotomous once again by being able to have the human spirit and being able to understand, <clears throat> understand spiritual uh, information and spiritual phenomena. Then we have the fourth brick. The character of God is taken care of by Christ's work on the cross, and it's understood by the doctrine of propitiation. Propitiation is very closely tied to expiation and sometimes is confused because of the way the English uses it. But propitiation is the winning back of the approval of God. So you have the substitutionary work 
And then the, after the work is done, then you have God saying, okay, I accept that work. And that's why we have Psalm 110.1, which says, this is the declaration of the Lord, that's God the Father, to my Lord, that's God the Son. When he says, sit down at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And so the idea is that he's having them sit at his right hand. That's the, that's the seat of honor, meaning that he accepts or he is satisfied, propitiated with the work that the Lord Jesus Christ performed with a substitutionary or expiation. Okay. Then the fifth brick in the barrier, man's righteousness or relative righteousness, minus R, was taken care of by Christ's work on the cross. And it is understood by two doctrines, imputation and justification. Imputation uh, is given to us in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He, that's God the Father, made the one, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, not having done known sin, to be a sin, slant, to be sin, slant a sin offering on, be, on our behalf, in order that we ourselves might become the righteousness of God in him. The idea is that the imputation of God's righteousness to the believer as a judicial imputation, meaning there's no real home or target for it, uh, is given to us as a result of Christ's work on the cross. We are now uh, considered to have God's righteousness. And as a result of that righteousness, then we are justified. Uh, it's just like if you have a security clearance, you have to go through the work, they give you the security clearance, okay? And the idea is then once you have the clearance, you have to have a right to know, I need to know as well, but once you have the clearance, then you're justified going into classified areas. Okay, it's not because of who and what you are in terms of what you look like, you know, or anything like that. It's because you're qualified to do it. Well, in this case, the qualification was given by God, uh, by the Lord Jesus Christ, and he, was, he imputed to us that righteousness, which then is justif justification for uh, entrance into heaven and justification for uh, continued function. And so we have Romans 3, 23 and 24, for all of sin comes short of the glory of God, receiving justification without payment by his grace through the instrumentality of the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus. In Romans 5, 1, therefore, after having been justified as a result of faith, let us have prosperity, slant peace, face to face with God, with the God through the instrumentality of our Lord Jesus Christ. So to be justified means to be free of guilt or the need for punishment and or to be innocent. It is the outcome of imputation of righteousness and recognition by God the Father, that, I mean by God, excuse me, that the believer has been saved as a result of the work of Christ on the cross. And we've studied the difference between justification and that silly phrase, just as if I've never sinned. The idea is that justification is much better because as a result of justification, we also have uh, <coughs> imputation and, and uh, we get more than we had had we never sinned. Had we never sinned, we wouldn't have had the righteousness of God. Now we have the righteousness of God. So it's wonderful. Not only was it taken care of, but we were given more on top. And then finally, the sixth brick, position in Adam, is taken care of by Christ's work on the cross, and it's explained by positional truth. To understand positional truth, we have to understand that there are two forms of positional truth. There's retroactive positional truth and current positional truth. We understand that as a result of the work of Christ on the cross and our acceptance of that work, we are no longer identified with Adam, but we are now identified with Christ. Okay? And that is the positional truth. Retroactive positional truth is a theological term that refers to identification with Christ in his death, his spiritual death, his physical death, and his burial. Okay? But we don't stop there. There are... There are uh, uh, denominations that stop there, okay? Uh, <clears throat> those that show Christ on the cross, for example. Uh, Protestants uh, have an empty cross as opposed to a crucifixion. The reason they have an empty cross is because they focus on the resurrection, okay? Christ uh, uh, rose, okay, which this a celebration we'll have next week uh, in most churches, okay? <clears throat> and so that, the, the positional truth, excuse me, retroactive is, is the uh, death Spiritual death, physical death, and burial, but we have, and what we focus on more, is current positional truth, which refers to his resurrection and his ascension and session. And we are looking forward to spending eternity in heaven with Christ because of that uh, resurrection, ascension, and session. And the current positional truth is reality of the union with Christ as he is seated at the right hand of God the Father and the identification with Christ in a strategic victory in the angelic conflict. We are the only army in the world, okay, in the history of mankind that has a guaranteed victory. We have a guaranteed victory, and all we have to do is function properly with everything that God has provided us, with the plan that God has provided us. We don't have to do anything uh, uh, in terms of trying to outfit ourselves for battle. Uh, you know, or anything. the battle is already uh, going, but we have been given the armory. We've, we understand the, the armor of God. We've given everything necessary to be victorious, and that's exactly what we understand from positional truth. We have 2 Corinthians 5.17, For this reason, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come into existence. That's, for example, why 
A Christian should never marry an unbeliever because you are a new existence. We have 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For as in fact in Adam all die, but it doesn't stop there. It says, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. That means all who have chosen to accept Christ and as a result be baptized in the union of Christ. And now they, they now possess eternal life and are looking forward to spending eternity with God in heaven. We understand that the moment that Jesus Christ said, Ted Lestai, uh, meaning that that's uh, perfect, meaning that it's finished with the idea that its results will go on for eternity, that the barrier was removed between God and man. I want you to understand something too. Okay, when, if, you, if you understand this, the, the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ said it is finished, okay, and he exhaled and didn't inhale. Okay, his job was done. And the reason I'm saying that is because I saw the other day an ad on the History Channel. Right? And they're doing it, of course, everybody's coming out of the woodwork to prepare for Easter. And they have a, a, a thing that at first when they were showing it, with except for the fact that they show him his really long hair and beard and all that kind of junk, okay, it looked like, yeah, they might actually have some decent information in there. And then the title hit me, The Killing of Jesus. Nobody killed Jesus. Okay? Nobody killed Christ. Christ's work was done, so he exhaled, and he just didn't inhale again. Okay? Nobody killed him. You need to understand that. Nobody is stronger than God. <laughs> okay? So, anyway, he exhaled, and he didn't inhale, and the barrier was removed. And, of course, this is pictured by the fact that at that moment, the huge curtain that was dividing the holy place from the Holy of Holies and the Temple of Jerusalem, and we've seen the picture of the Temple of Jerusalem, gone through the different uh, layers, okay, uh, that, that, that uh, barrier was removed, meaning that now, they had access to the Holy of Holies. This, of course, is ignored in Jewish tradition, but given to us in, in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The Universalist, of course, says that the barrier being removed means that all mankind is now saved. Okay? And they're wrong. The universal, Universalists uh, took it right up, to the, you know, right up to the edge, but they forgot to take it the rest of the way. And the rest of the way is the fact that there is a sin that the Lord Jesus Christ could not pay for, and that sin was rejection of himself. Okay? <clears throat> And, of course, he couldn't pay for rejection of himself because the penalty for that was that he would have to spend eternity in the lake of fire. And he can't spend eternity in the lake of fire because he has so much left to do. He has to be seated at the right hand of God, the Father, during the church age. We see that all the time. He must come back to take the church to himself at the rapture. He has to return at the second advent. He has to be on the earth for the baptism of fire. And then he rules during the millennium. And, of course, he, might, he has to sit on the great white throne at the end of the millennium. And he has to rule in eternity future. So therefore, he has a lot of work yet to do, and he can't do that if he's spending eternity in the lake of fire. Therefore, what we have now is a new barrier, and that new barrier is the Lord Jesus Christ. If an individual believes on the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ for his salvation, then he no longer has a barrier. and He has become a believer, and he has, can look forward to uh, spending eternity in heaven with God. However, if he doesn't, then he is then... Uh, uh, if he doesn't accept the personal work of the Lord Jesus Christ, then he then has a barrier, and he will not have that relationship with God. And instead, he will spend eternity in the lake of fire. And remember, we get a resurrection body no matter what happens to us. One will be uh, to take us into heaven and be, give us, uh, give us uh, the ability to have eternity in uh, heaven with God. The other one, for the unbelievers, is going to be a resurrection body that's perfectly attuned to pain, perfectly attuned to, to, uh, to uh, discipline, and to be drenched in a, you know, the idea is drenched in a lake of fire is if you've ever burned yourself with skin on your body, you can imagine what it would be like to have your nerves on the outside of your body and to undergo that kind of punishment for all eternity. Not something I think anybody would look forward to. So, of course, the idea is now all anyone has to do is to say, yes, God, I accept the person and the work of Christ on my behalf for salvation. That's given to us in Romans 10, 9 and 10. And at that point, the individual has eternal life and will spend eternity in heaven with God. That's given to us in Romans 8, 38 and 39. So that is the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so now we're going to go ahead and pass out the juice. We'll read the scripture, take a moment for reflection, and we'll close with a song.
the scripture that we read <clears throat> to remind us and, uh, to do this and to uh, make sure that we have this on the forefront of our mind at least once a month is 1 Corinthians 11, 25. It says, in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant slant contract in my blood. Keep on doing this as often as you should be drinking it in remembrance of me. Let us partake. Okay, we'll close with a song. If you'll stand, please, we're going to sing song number...